on to the purchase contract. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, wonderful. Yes. All right, it doesn't matter. Let me start this. It doesn't matter if you're on dot loop or DocuSign. This purchase contract should be the same purchase contract everyone's using. So there shouldn't be any surprises. I'm not even gonna tell you which one I'm using, although you can clearly see which one I'm using. It doesn't matter. In dot loop, you have an autofill function. In DocuSign, I'm assuming there's something similar. <coughs> When you use the autofill function, it just speeds up this process for writing an offer. So I would encourage you to use it. But for this practice, we're just going to run from top to bottom. So let's just say the property address is 123 Main Street, uh, Hilliard, Ohio 43026. What should I make sure that is at the top of every page where it says premises address? address the correct address of yes list sir of one two three great and when i type it in here i think it should auto populate on each page let's see if it does and it does so that's easy our goal here is to write the cleanest most complete offer possible so that when the listing agent receives our offer, they're getting a clean one and they can easily understand it and it's legally binding. I mean, but honestly, you don't even have to put the address in right there because it'll populate in automatically um, from the, uh, the other uh, page. Correct. I'm doing somewhere. this so that we, we see this. Um, it will autofill. We're just doing it old school. Gotcha. The date. If you autofill, the date doesn't populate. So today is the first. This is when our offer is being submitted. It's not the date that the, the offer is going to end on or expire on. It's the date that you are actually submitting the offer. I'm going to repeat. The date is the date you're submitting the offer. So today is the first. <coughs> what county is it? It's Franklin. Uh, oops, sorry. Amanda's trying to get in. Parcel number. This is important. Where can I find the parcel number? Give me two places. Auditor's website. Perfect. MLS. And the MLS. other one? MLS. Yep, the MLS listing should have the parcel number. Now, I will say this. There are situations where the listing will notate multiple parcel numbers. We had a situation where we wrote a contract and didn't include that other parcel number and closing got delayed because the title company didn't realize that that was part of the, the transaction. So let's make sure that as we're writing offers, we're paying really close attention to the listing itself in the MLS. A lot of times it will notate um, this listing contains two parcel numbers. So we'd write those in here. Parcel number, for those of you who haven't seen them, are a lot of numbers with hyphens, dashes, whatever you call them. And um, they, need to be, they need to be pinpointed on here because this is a legal document and the parcel number is... Uh, like tax record type stuff. So again, auditor's website is where you'll find that. And then you'll compare and contrast and make sure it's the same both places, auditor's site and the MLS listing. What if they don't match up? Like if you're looking at both? I would err on the side of the, uh, the auditor's website, but I would also contact the agent, the listing agent to advise them, hey, I don't know which one's right. Can you guide me? Do you know something I don't know? When in doubt, always reach out. Okay, so we're just gonna, I'm gonna make something up here. Zero one, zero one. Okay, cool. That's the parcel number, just made that up. Further described as, this just so happens to be a three bed 
two bath home located at one, two, three Main Street, Billiard, Ohio, 43026. So note, note that I put a brief description of the physical characteristics of the home along with its physical address. If you guys get caught up on this or you can't remember what I'm talking about, you know, three weeks from now when you're writing an offer, I sent an email to everyone on, I believe it was Tuesday. It had a five minute video on how to type an offer. So it's really short and sweet, but it goes over things at a very high level. It's like a Cliff's Notes version. Purchase price. <laughs> Always include the dollar sign. If you auto populate this, it won't include a dollar sign and it'll look like it's 200,000. So purchase price shall be 200,000. 200,000 what? 200,000 hot dogs? <coughs> we are proficient. So we are gonna make sure that we always have the dollar sign. Can somebody tell me what I typed down here? 200,000, the word is typed out. Yeah. Just like writing a check. Bingo. Cool. For the sake of time, we're gonna skip over 1.1 here. We're gonna end with 1.1. We're gonna go over some strategy, things that are winning offers right now. I know we do that a lot, but um, things always but things always be. Okay, attorney approval call. Attorney approval call. Uh, somebody needs to mute themselves, please. please. I'm hearing so, an echo. I'm hearing an echo. <clears throat> talk to me. Somebody talk to me about the. Uh, somebody can unmute now. Talk to me about the attorney approval clause. What's uh? What's your spiel when you're doing an offer for somebody who is, um, maybe it's their first offer. What do you tell them about section two here? And I've never yeah, seen anyone actually know. utilize it. Unless they have a power of attorney. Right. Yeah, so what we're so supposed what to we're do, supposed we're not to supposed to, we're not supposed to. I think it's Brian, think are, it's you Brian. are you driving? I'm gonna mute you, sorry, man. Um, what we're supposed to do is make sure that they're aware of their rights as a buyer to utilize an attorney if you'd like. What I normally do is give them the caveat to say, hey, an attorney's probably gonna cost you 500 bucks to review this. These contracts are written by attorneys and any attempts to overhaul this contract probably will not be successful, but I understand if you'd like somebody to review it. <coughs> so you're giving them the chance. Some people are super gung-ho and do want an attorney to re review it, but to Brian's point, it's few and far between. Somebody tell me about section 3.1 here. What's this basically saying? That just talks about um, what finance buyer will use to make the purchase. If it'll be cash or financing. Perfect. So what are, let's say 90% of offers, are they cash or uh, um, lender affiliated? Most of mine have been lender. Yeah. Affiliated. Yeah. So most of the time, as we look at section 3.1 here on the contract, we don't want our buyer, if they're going to use a lender to fill this out. So we want to make sure that this, uh, that this is assigned to no one. We don't want any confusion once we send this over to our buyers because it's all done electronically. If we don't change this, then they have the opportunity to fill that out. If it is a cash buyer, by all means, fill this out along with proof of, uh, proof of funds. More often than not, we are using financing. So this is where we would have our buyer. In this case, we're using Mr. Jerry Clark. 
And then it's only him buying. So we're gonna make sure this other box is not checked off. No confusion. Uh, Josh, really quickly, how long do they, how long do you usually give for proof of funds if it is cash? Three days. Three days. I normally send it with the offer. I don't want them to okay. question whether or not we can actually afford it. So this is legwork that you should probably do ahead of time, meaning, okay. hey, you want to offer on this home? Great. Do me a favor because I know they're going to ask. Send me a screenshot of your bank account. Make sure the account numbers are blurred out or not present, which most, most banks you go through their website, they're not showing the account number. But let's send them a screenshot or pair with a bank to actually have a statement. That's possible as well. And Brian uh, Greasy says, send with send it with the offer to make your offer stronger. That's like right now. That's that's the most urgent way, and that's the best way to win an offer like immediately is to send proof of everything right away. Good question, Kathy. Thanks for asking. <clears throat> All right. So more often than not, three point two is where we're living. If I have a pre-approval letter which I should, if you're protecting your time, y'all should have pre-approvals already in hand for your buyers. Now, sometimes their pre-approval might be for 180,000, but they want this $200,000 house. So you need to go back to the lender and say, hey, can you update my pre-approval le uh, letter? Regardless, if I have it, I'm gonna have them initial here. And if for some reason I don't, then I'm gonna have them initial over here and say that I will get it to you within two days. Loan application. It says if left blank, the calendar day shall be seven. I like to, most lenders that I work with can get a loan application done in two or three days. So I normally write two, three, four at the most. If it's during the weekend or if you're offering on a Friday, how many days should you probably put in there? Six. Six, let's see what else, five. Yeah, there's no golden number here, guys. Just, just account for the weekend because no one's probably gonna be doing much work on the weekends. So give yourself enough time, but don't make it so much time that, this, that the seller thinks that you're not serious. So don't make it like 10 days, that's crazy. Make a formal application for right in the type of the loan, conventional FHA, VA, USDA. Of these types, what's the most um, competitive loan type? Conventional. <laughs> Why? Um, uh, less hoops to jump through. Not like their your FHA and VA requirements for the house. Um, it's easier right. that they're going to go through minimal uh, down payment, or you you know that they have a larger down payment usually with that as opposed to an FHA or VA. Great. So I will write in, sorry, I should, should remember that I'm filling this out. So we're going to go five days here and this is conventional. Beautiful. There's some parts of this guys that I hardly ever look at and <laughs> you don't need to be a lawyer reading through all 14 pages here. I typically, when I'm typing the offer, I've been through the contract before. I've attended contract classes. If you have not attended contract classes, please do. I'm talking like continued education classes. They're great. They're taught by lawyers who wrote them and they give you the reasoning behind the reason. It's really good. But anyways, I like to typically focus on the things that I control. So in this situation, 3.2C, the loan commitment. I was just talking with somebody this morning, that person will know who they are. And they had a, a, an offer that they were writing for a lawyer or the, a lawyer was a part of the, the, uh, yeah. the and it was, it was difficult because the lawyer thought they knew better mm -hmm. and they clearly didn't. And so they were under the impression that it takes a long, long, long time for a loan commitment to be issued. When in actuality, the average, I would say 25 days. Don't be swayed by what other people think. Be the professional. 
Now you're the professional. Now you know it's 25 days for a loan commitment. The loan commitment simply means the lender is giving the green light that, hey, we can lend on this person. Wait. Yes, Maureen. Um, it is, um, well, I know how long it takes to get a loan approval as a buyer. You know, sometimes it takes forever. Um, are they, are you saying they can do it now in 25 days? Yeah, uh, most lenders but, right now, as long as there's no craziness happening in the background, if you've got, if it's an estate or you've got, you know, crazy, weird buying situation, you've got a bunch of different co-buyers and stuff, then you might need to write in a longer time. But if it's just you buying the home and it's pretty straightforward, uh, normally 21 days is how early they can do them, some even earlier, but 25 is kind of the, the industry standard that we're seeing right now. Um, well, I had a personal situation where, um, we had our own business, um, and have had a, our own business for a couple of generations and Chase, um, I mean, the under kept delaying it and delaying it and delaying it. They wanted more information and more documentation and more documentation. And it went on and on and on and on and on. And, um, you know, we finally literally just walked away. I don't know if anybody has run into that as, as an agent. Um, it's a bigger lenders, time. right? It happens from time to time. Here's, here's the simple answer to that. Let's not use Chase as a lender. They are too large to handle quick transactions. They're great for personal banking. I bank with them myself. I have business and checking accounts. But for the case, for the sake of buying a home, I can never recommend them. Uh, I, I was in a situation uh, in a contract with them as well. And it took us forever to close as well. Yeah. The larger the bank, the slower the turnaround time. So let's try not okay. to use people like that. Uh, totally makes sense. And yeah, okay. Um, and then Brian says, Chase didn't even order an appraisal when my clients bought in Clintonville. Didn't require it and closed as quickly. Well, there are certain situations where a blind squirrel finds a nut, Brian. <laughs> <coughs> Um, appraisal contingency. So this is just stating that there's going to likely be an appraisal in certain situations like Brian, the home and or the percentage of money that you're bringing in to put down on the home will uh, allow a waiver of appraisal. But in most situations, there is an appraisal. Taxes and assessments. I've never had to fill this out, guys. Um, if, th if there's anything that needs to be filled out here, it should be notated on the listing. Any tax information, like delinquent taxes and stuff. If there are liens on the property, those should be listed on the agent to agent document um, um, comments, most likely. But this is a portion that I typically skip right over. Fixtures and equipment. I'm gonna write down the same thing I write for every single offer I write. All fixtures viewed in the home on, let's just say we just saw the home today. All fixtures viewed in the home on 7-1-21, including all kitchen appliances, light fixtures, and window hardware. What this does is just, it just repeats what you see above it in all these bullet points, but it clarifies. There's, there's no wiggle room now. It's going to come with all these things. Additionally, if there are things like a washer and dryer, a ring doorbell that's going to stay, you would write those things in here. The following shall be excluded. If it specifically states certain things that should be excluded, 
Here's a, a perfect example of something that I have read and I've had to write in the contract myself. Excludes, let's see here. Um, the listing and the agent to agent comment says that the, the seller would like to take their family heirloom draperies in the living room. Okay, cool. We don't care. We didn't like them anyways, they were ugly. <laughs> so go ahead and take those. The following least items shall be excluded. So I don't normally fill this out, but let's say security system is kind of the, the typical thing. Security systems don't um, normally convey with the property. It's a least item. So you'd have to renew that security system. But I normally leave this part blank. Inspections and tests. We are encouraged to have people conduct inspections on the home that they are purchasing. If you ever have told or ever considered telling somebody, hey, I'd recommend not getting any, any inspections. You're, do, you're not doing your fiduciary duty. That being said, the, ver, the way to say that in this competitive market where people are waiving inspection remedies, people are waiving inspections, period, is to say this. This is my this is my script. Guys, I want to encourage you to get an inspection on your home. I want to I want to encourage you to get all the inspections on your home. And I also, as your fiduciary, I must tell you that competitive offers right now are seeing inspections being waived and or the remedy portion of the inspection being waived. I'm only giving you all your options. However, I want to return to what I said initially. I want to encourage you to get all your inspections done. What you're doing there is you're covering your butt and you're enlightening them to what winning offers look like. You're going to stay out of trouble and you might encourage them through that conversation in order to be most competitive to consider using verbiage that maybe waives the inspection remedy or the inspection altogether. Never recommend it though. Never recommend them waiving all inspections. So I never write more than seven days. I've got an inspector. Uh, I think he's been on the call with us before, Tony, who gets into homes within three days normally, but seven days is a good buffer, especially if you're on a holiday week like this week. Never write more than the max I see on competitive offers is 10 days. Don't go over 10 days unless it's a, a crazy situation where your buyer really wants to be there and they're out of town for the next two weeks or whatever. There should be no reason that you need more than seven days. Now, consider radon. What can you all tell me about a radon test? <coughs> What are the doesn't timing requirements be, for radon? Um, doesn't have to be um, under 4.0. The results need to be under four. Yeah. For the radon test to be conducted, it needs to be set in the home, in the basement, typically one day. And then typically it takes 48 hours for them to receive the results and go pick up their test. So and all windows to, have to stay shut. Yeah, you need to contact, you need to make sure that you are accounting for that if the person's getting a radon test. So seven days to complete the inspections. So don't schedule a radon test for the sixth or seventh day to be delivered because it's not going to be back. Moral of the story is as soon as this contract gets accepted, we should be notifying all parties of all the timelines the very next day so that we start hitting these, these uh, hurdles. So let's just say it's a typical offer and we are gonna do remedy down here in the remedy period, three, three days. What that means is that the inspections have been done. We submitted over to the seller a list of things we would like to be fixed. And we have three days to negotiate a conclusion 
whether that looks like they agree to everything, they agree to nothing, or something in between. Sometimes they'll even throw money at you to try and get this thing done. Regardless of what they decide to do, three days is the amount of time we have. Oddly enough, this sounds like they'd be the most friction during the course of a transaction. I have, I have somehow gotten lucky. I've not had a single thing fall out of contract during the remedy period, meaning because we're good agents, we can find a way to find a middle ground for both sides to make it easy. Any questions on the inspection slash remedy part here? This is important. We'll move on. Right here, you see a reference to two weeks ago where we had the condom, condominium and HOA portion of our um, uh, coaching. We talked about all this right here, 6.5. So if you're buying a condo, you can rest assured that you're gonna get those condo documents because they're literally in the contract. It's important that we know that and can warn our buyers to say, hey, in the next five days after they accept our offer, we're gonna receive some paperwork that I'm gonna want you guys to review to make sure that this condo is cool for you guys. Because we know you've got those 15 dogs and I'm not sure that they'll accept 15 dogs. <clears throat> Warranties, this is where you put a home warranty in. So let's just say this is again, this is two years ago that we're writing this offer and we're able to actually request a home warranty. Wonderful. The, the verbiage here is at a cost not to exceed to the seller. So the seller purchases this. So let's just say the home warranty that I know of costs, I don't know, let's say $420. And it's done by First American Home Warranty. It's done. So you guys might be asking, well, who orders the home warranty? Well, once they accept our offer, we can go ahead and order that home warranty. We don't pay anything out of pocket. The seller doesn't even pay anything out of pocket until closing. But once we get the invoice for that, we send it to the title company and they will make sure that the correct person gets billed. This remains blank for me. I've, let's read it. Seller has not transferred, conveyed, or reserved, nor sell, does seller have any knowledge of any prior transfers, conveyances, yada, yada, of coal, oil, gas, or other mineral rights in the premises, except for the following. This is going to be more prevalent out in the country, probably not in the metro areas. And again, anything that would be listed here should be on the listing. Title insurance, this is the seller here in central Ohio pays for title insurance. That's typically, I'm just going to put a number out there, about, about $1,000 for the normal trans average transaction, $1,000 that the seller pays for. Title insurance simply gives the buyer peace of mind knowing that they're buying a home free and clear of any liens. Utilities should be paid up. Bunch of other verbiage here, legalese. Earnest money. Let's say in order to remain competitive, we're gonna do the old antiquated earnest money thing. Earnest money, if you all don't know, I'm just gonna say it. Actually, no, can somebody tell me what earnest money is? Basically to put you in good faith. Otherwise known as good faith money. And what that basically means is that you can afford some scratch out of pocket right away, meaning you can afford money out of pocket from the jump. And that gives the seller peace of mind knowing that if you can afford $1,000 or $500 or whatever right away, then odds are, bye Brian, odds are you can afford the home. It's a little antiquated because at no point during the transaction can you not get this money back. I don't know why we do it still, but it's old school and people wanna see it still. So let's just say thousand bucks. Real quick question, Josh. Does yeah. the um, earnest money depend 
sometimes typically like if it's a $200,000 property versus an $800,000 property, how do you guide your client to do that? Or is it usually just a thousand dollars or no, that's a great, great question. I'm so glad you asked it. I ask the realtor, the listing agent, I say to them, Hey, we're thinking of putting an offer in. What can you tell me about the perfect offer? And then I stop talking and let them spill their guts, hopefully, and give me all the secrets. <laughs> and if they don't mention earnest money, I ask, I say, what about earnest money? Is your client interested in that? And if they say, yes, earnest money is important, but not a deal breaker. Then mm -hmm. I say to myself, well, uh, we need to, we need to do earnest money then if it's, if it's kind of important even, because we want to separate ourselves from the rest mm -hmm. and the amount I normally ask, I straight up, I'm like, what's, what's a good amount in your guys' eyes? Is it, you know, I know this is a million dollar home. Is it $10,000? Is it, mm -hmm. you know, 15,000? What's that look like? But yeah, typically on a $200,000 house, I throw $500, maybe a thousand on a 350 and up two 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 thousands fair. I feel like over half a million, maybe 5,000. So maybe you're looking at a, you know, 10, not even 10% or 1%. But they, notice there are two pieces here. There's two options in regards to earnest money. So we're, we're telling them how much, but when. This top portion say, states that within three days after acceptance of the contract. This piece down here says three days after the expiration of the remedy period. So this bottom portion here basically lets us get through the remedy negotiation. Oh. The top piece is more instant. It's literally, hey, you're going into contract today. I need that check in the next three days. And then that earnest money gets deposited where? With the realtor. Keller Williams. At the brokerage. At the brokerage. The check <laughs> needs to be made out to your Keller Williams and it needs to be taken to your MCA along with an earnest money deposit form. I always take a photo of the check and the earnest money deposit form and I cover up the account number and I send it to the other side as proof that the check has been deposited. Where's the form for that? Is that in the command? There, well, there should be one in DocuSign. We have one in dot loops. I'm 99.9% .9 sure you'll have one in DocuSign as well. And if not, we also have them at the front desk and I'm sure you guys, we probably do here at Capital Partners as well. So they should be in the loop or, or sorry, or the room, DocuSign dot loop. They should be in the actual system. But the way I do it is I just walk in, grab one from the front desk and fill it out old school. It's the one thing that I do old school requiring paper. Good questions. Uh, the brokerage, you're just going to type in the brokerage name down here. You don't have the check yet, so you can't determine what the check number is. And it doesn't actually get signed by anybody. This this part of the, tr the, the contract, in my professional opinion, is a little antiquated. There's a whole bunch of, of stuff here, guys. I, I encourage you to go about reading this on your own and or, again, I can't encourage you enough, attend a contracts class. We don't have time today to read through everything here. <clears throat> I'm really focusing on the things that we control. Closing, if I'm writing the contract today, when would be a reasonable amount of time for me to close? Thirty. 45 days. I usually do 20 to 30 days. 45. What is fair right now, what most people are seeing is 30 to 45 days. 45 days is the max. And that's normally more like for FHA loans. I would oh, okay. encourage us to stay as close to that 30 day range as possible. Keeping in mind, you can't close on the weekend. Okay. 
Okay. Also keeping in mind the end of the month for lenders, brokerages, title companies is busy, busy, busy. For some reason, we all want to close at the end of the month. Um, so in this situation, 30 days would be the 31st. You might give a little bit of grace and just go over here to Monday the 2nd. It's really specific to what the, the seller wants and also what your buyer wants. All this stuff that we're talking about right here is a conversation you should have with your buyer prior to filling out the contract so that you're not wasting your time. So we'll say closing is uh, on the 2nd of August. Final walkthrough, two days. Can you do it before? Sure. Can you do it after? Sure. But before closing, encourage your people to do a final walkthrough just to verify that everything that you requested is in good shape, to verify that the house hasn't burnt down, that they haven't uh, had a flooded toilet for a month and no, told nobody about it. Really important to do that final walkthrough. And then one of the last things we control is the possession date. So the possession date is typically like in a normal, in a normal world, it's normally at closing. But lately, the past few years, people are asking for extended possession, meaning they stay in the property even after they don't own it. So in this situation, if closing happens August 2nd, a lot of people are asking for a week. So we would say possession happens on the 9th. I always like to put a time for possession as well so that it's very clear. So at 12 p.m. This is that line. Josh, I have a question. I have a question yes. about that possession date um, because some of the uh, listings have said seller needs time to find suitable housing. So if you have a situation like that, would you just put negotiable? Yes. Okay. Good call out. Debris and personal property. This is where if you're a listing agent, for the love of God, tell your people to clean your house before they get out. Mm -hmm. And for poor Amanda's sake, don't tell them that it's okay to leave all the trash on the curb. Amanda had literally a mountain of trash left for her clients after possession occurred. Bad deal. Makes the other agent look, look bad. Don't be that agent. Last thing that we control here is date, or sorry, this offer shall be open for acceptance through. This is establishing an expiration of your offer. So for us, let's say it's July 1st. Well, I am a huge fan. If there's not already an offer deadline, some people say, hey, I uh, want all offers in by Tuesday at one o'clock and uh, eligible for acceptance through nine o'clock. If they do that, cool, follow their orders if you want to. I'm a fan of being aggressive and putting a great offer together and putting an aggressive timeline for them to not be able to think. What I mean by that is I don't want them sleeping on this for days and allowing other showings to come through the house and to trump my offer. So for me, if we're offering right now, let's say we get this offer in by two o'clock. In my estimation, it's fair to go... 9 p.m. tonight. <laughs> you can be aggressive like that. I would not encourage you to say 4 p.m. That's being really bold and too bold because people are at work right now, most likely. They're not going to answer their phone for their realtor. Um, I mean, some people will, but some won't. Don't risk it. Put it, something aggressive together, though. That's going to be what wins an offer. Not allowing people days and days to make a decision. Josh, real quick, with the thing that I had over the weekend. So if the realtor sets a time that they're accepting all offers through a certain time, you have to do it after that, correct? If they make an offer, say three days before they're going to accept the offer, can how does that work? You do not have to. Is it, is it a good look to? Sure. But why play by the rules? 
those aren't actual rules. That's just a guideline. Like if I offer today with an expiration due to our fiduciary, right. As, as realtors, we have to submit that offer to our, to our seller. We have to go back to Honduras, right? So here's what I've done, Kathy, to answer your question. <clears throat> and this has been successful some, and it's, it's been unsuccessful some. If that's the situation, like we're seeing a lot. So let's say a home comes on the market on Tuesday, but they want all offers in by Sunday, left open till Monday. That's almost a week. Let's say I go see it on Tuesday. They love it. They want to write an offer on it. Why not try to write an aggressive offer only good till Wednesday and let the agent say, Hey, did you see my instructions? Or actually I would, I normally, uh, pre preface it with saying, I saw your instructions, but I think this offer is awesome and we'd love for you to accept it. And I'd love to work with you. The agent's going to do one of two things. They're either going to accept it because it's a great offer and they're going to, they're going to, um, not abide by what they wrote on the listing, or they're going to tell you, Hey, we really appreciate your offer, but can you just extend it till next Tuesday or next Monday, next Tuesday, whatever I said, then a lot of times they'll tell me, Hey, your offer is the best right now, but my clients really want to wait to see if anything better comes along. So can you extend it? So I'm getting more information out of them than I had before. And I'm showing aggressiveness and assertiveness, and they probably respect that. Normally, the first offer a person gets go, is very highly regarded in their eyes. So I like to be the aggressor, be the first offer in. And a lot of, a lot of listing agents are putting the verbiage, may accept the right offer before the deadline if it comes along. Okay. And then the other thing on that one, when you say that, like if they tell you, you have, we have to wait, do you do a whole new contract or can you just do an, an addendum to that? Like, how does that work? No, I just literally go into the original contract that I just typed up and I extend the deadline and okay. then I have my guys re-sign it. Okay. But ultimately I, I don't like to play by that rule. I think it's a, it's a rule for um, the sheep and I don't want to be a sheep. I'm gonna be a lion winning those <laughs> offers. Yeah. So I have a I get a, a little confused on the on this um in this market where they say all offers in by Sunday at noon. Right. Mm -hmm. So given that situation, um they um the realtor, the listing sees all of the offers ahead of time assuming right yeah Let's i mean the, the listing agent will see the offers as they're coming through as they're coming through and then so they they take the best one that's where i get stuck do they take the best one or do they uh get into an a bidding war it's totally up to them if it's me I'm pitting one against the other and trying to get the purchase price up. So you just call the other agent with the second best offer and say, we have a better offer. Yeah. The listing side, there's only really one day of work work when you're, when you're the listing agent. And that's the day that you determine that you want to start negotiations. Like that's the day where you're on your phone, like trying to play the game. And if we want to, we could have a whole class on listing negotiations, but yeah, um, to answer your question, any smart realtor is as soon as they start getting offers, they're going to start, start working it and saying, Hey, I know the offer deadline is not for another three days, but man, your, your offer is great. It, however, it did just get beat. Do you want to beef yours up? But you can't give them any information. You can do whatever your sellers tell you can do. And that's another conversation beforehand. Like, hey, what information will you allow me to share? Will you allow me to be an open book and just give them all the answers so that they know exactly how much to go up to? Sometimes that's the right play. If there's a person who's really close, um, but you think you can get another thousand dollars out of them, and you say, hey, this other person just beat you by by five hundred bucks. Can you come up to the thousand? 
Do whatever your client tells you to do. Sometimes to make this harder than it really is. At the end of the day, do whatever your agent, your client tells you to do. Okay. Finishing up real quick, guys, we got five minutes left. So down the last page of the offer is where you put the expiration date. It's also where your, your client signs. And then you fill out your information and the other side listing agents information. I encourage you, the cleanest offers, this is written out pretty much in full. So this, in order to get this information, uh, your brokerage should have it. It should probably be in an email to you somewhere. If you need it, then reach out to myself or to, uh, you can also look on the listing to get all the information for this side, for the, the seller. And if you need your own information, then go through your records. All right, I told you we'd end with this part up here, section 1.1. Let's just say what I'm typically seeing right now are people wanting to waive inspection remedy. It still entitles them to an inspection, but they're not gonna ask for anything. However, if the inspection comes back terrible, you can walk away free of charge. No earnest money withheld. There are, there are clauses saved in DocuSign and in DotLoop. In DotLoop, they'll auto-populate if you start typing them out, which is nice. In DocuSign, you have to go find it, copy it, and paste it. If ever you have questions or are held up on what to say, these clauses are written by lawyers. Therefore, we don't have to think through it. So I'm seeing this one. I'm seeing appraisal shortage, gapping the appraisal we've heard. That just means, <coughs> in an example, the lender's only gonna lend what the property appraises for. So if you're in contract for 200,000 in this situation, but it appraises for 190, there's a gap of $10,000. The, the, the lender is not giving you 200, they're giving you 190. So that gap, either we renegotiate the contract or we put some provision in here stating that we will bridge that gap up to a certain amount. So a lot of the verbiage that I see, come on in, <coughs> um, looks like in case of short appraisal, Buyer agrees to bridge the gap by up to Is this titillating uh, webinar material here. Um, in case of short appraisal, buyer agrees to bridge the uh, I should say the shortage, the shortage by up to $10,000, not to exceed the original agreed upon purchase price. So in our situation here, if it appraised at 185, we would be on the hook for $10,000, making the new purchase price 195. Does that make sense? Yes, but real quick question, Josh, where did you say we could find all of these uh, terms and conditions if we need to look up different ones when they're unique? I talked to Rachel on DocuSign. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll try to send something out to the group, but she said that there is a port, there's a part on DocuSign that houses all these that you can find them on. Okay. Um, because I never use it, I'm not well equipped to speak to that. Okay. So guys, this is how we write a contract. It can be confusing the first few times because it's hard to remember, oh, what did Josh say I put in here? Have faith. This recording will be uploaded to Zoom tomorrow, to uh, YouTube tomorrow. Additionally, I sent everyone an email with a five minute version of this on Tuesday. If you threw it in the trash, then it's on you guys. I'm doing everything I can to get you guys the information you need to be well equipped to write an offer. Go dig it out of the trash. And then lastly, on the YouTube page, there are multiple things about how to write an offer, how to negotiate an offer, et cetera. So I wanna encourage y'all on the front side to be well versed at this so that you're not surprised when you have to write a, a contract 
I don't want any surprises. Cool. Thanks, guys. I appreciate y'all. Congratulations, Chris. Your money. I'm gonna make you come into the office and grab your money so I can see you. <laughs> just like I made, just like I made Brand Brendan here come in. Hi, Brendan. How's it going? So uh, I appreciate you guys, and I look forward to hearing about a lot of successful offers. Go have a wonderful Fourth of July weekend, but get your contacts. See ya. Bye.